morning. Today is the day that we're going to begin the series on uh, the varieties of prayer. And uh, in this series, it's uh, you'll have some homework. Because it's no good to learn about it and not practice it. I want you to experience it. We're kind of limited here, not only on time, but on the setting to actually practice some of these uh, here. But we'll try. We'll try to give five minutes, ten minutes to practice one or two uh, of these uh, here in, uh, at the, in this time frame. The main thing about prayer that you'll look if you Google all this stuff is the main thing about prayer is you'll find it'll say the top five, or not the top five, they'll say the five ways to pray, the seven ways to pray, the 25 ways to pray, the 95, I saw one time, different ways to pray. So uh, prayers like cooking and chili or all those things that everybody makes it different, everybody experiences it different. Some people say, oh, that's not hot at all, put more pepper in, and other people will say, oh, I can't stand it, you waved the pepper over the chili and now it's too hot. So every everybody experiences it differently. There's no standard way, but there are some traditional ways. Did anybody grow up, Kim, did you grow up with the, uh, I've heard of people that uh, grew up and they were taught you stand to honor, you kneel to confess, you uh, sit, they, to listen. sit to listen, yeah, there were about five of them, yeah. and all those were ways of saying, it was mixing your piety, which often goes with prayer, uh, and piety are the gestures you do. Even though you you don't think you're doing a gesture, let's say I, I went. Uh, I remember the first time I went to a Baptist church, and I uh, went with a school friend of mine in, in college. And he uh, first thing he did was it was a one of those folding chair using somebody's room kind of place. And first thing he got in, and he pulled his shoes off and leaned back in the chair and sat like this. I thought. That's the way he relaxes and gets ready for prayer. Just sat in a chair, you know. And remember, Baptists uh, especially, uh, they're used to all the performance being up here on the stage. And sometimes you don't even say a word the whole service. You might say amen or, or uh, preach it or something like that or... You might sing along lightly with the choir, but there's no such thing as congregational songs. There's no such thing as coming forward for a blessing or, they have communion, but it's always in the evening, and it's uh, once a quarter, once a month, and it's a, I guess, a less formal service than ours. And uh, so the things you do, that's your piety. Who here does the uh, three crosses with the gospel? The gospel according to St. John. And some people do everything I think, everything I say, everything in my heart be yours, almighty God. So that's, that's the three crosses. The three crosses come from the Orthodox. They do that all the time. Uh, the triple cross. I didn't even know what... <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up in the Catholic Church or the Methodist Church, but went to the American Catholic Church, you know, in my adult life. So their masses and things are very similar to everything that you do. I, I don't know. Yeah. And that is not meant to be a universal, that's not a Anglican thing that everybody should be doing. Now, Kneeling at confession, if you're able, we're not able because we don't have any, but uh, is normal for Anglican service. Standing at the gospel, that's a normal piety and an Anglican service. 
crossing yourself. Now, some people make a big deal. Oh, he, my son is left-handed. You know, he does it wrong. You know, there's no wrong way to do the cross. As a matter of fact, in the Middle Ages, you know, most people are right-handed. The priest would do like this, and everybody would follow the priest's hand. So the priest is right-handed, so the priest goes down, and then, yeah, and then I go to the left. I go to the left, so everybody went to the right in the Middle Ages because they saw, it. and then they went to the. Oh, went, he went to the right. Anyway, they followed his hand, and so they were doing it the opposite. He was doing it. They were doing the mirror image, and then they people began to think that's the only way you should do it, and that's the right way, even though they were doing the opposite of the priest. But um, so we pick up things, and we tend to think. Because we picked them up in church, they're right forever, and everybody does it the same way in England, in Australia, in South America. And uh, those are minor things that don't really, uh, the things that we pick up, but they're all piety. Um, some women will not wear pants in church, because when they were growing up, you wore a skirt to church. And there's a certain, every family has a thing, every culture has a thing. Latin America has a little shorter thing about their skirts and, and uh, European America generally go below the knee. And it's just, that's a mixing, mixing of things. And they become pieties, they become individual pieties. It's okay to have your own way of doing things. CNA went to a really, um, what? Lutheran? No, no, the uh, All Saints. Uh, an uh, Anglican church that was Caribbean influence because it had a lot of Caribbean people. And she picked up uh, bowing at, the, what do you, what is it you do? At the end of the pew. Yeah, you picked up a number of their pieties um, and you carry them on to today because I guess it means something to you. But it's not, it's not a universal thing that's done everywhere. Fasting on Good Friday, that's universal. Fasting on Ash Wednesday, that's universal. Standing at the Gospel, that's universal. Uh, kneeling or standing at communion, if you're able. Uh, that's universal. Um, uh, the sign of the cross, crossing, uh, is universal. Although, a lot of people that didn't grow up with that just seem not to do it, which is okay. But... Um, so with prayer comes piety. So let's just start. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When you do something like that, you're already starting to narrow your focus, concentrate on something. So remember that your pieties are there to encourage and to prepare you for prayer and to prepare you to come out of prayer. So if I say, in, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, even if that's in the scripture and somebody's reading it during the scripture, what is it? What is the congregate? There's always people in the congregation that even though it's just it's part of the reading, it's not part of a prayer where you're expected to respond, there's always maybe about half or a little less of the congregation that says amen. But you're interrupting them reading because it's just a response, right? You automatically do it because that's the response to that phrase. So we're interjecting our piety into the reading even though we're not even thinking about it. It's an automatic response. It's kind of like people would say, Alleluia during Lent at the end of things, right? You're used to saying Alleluia at certain things and then all of a sudden in Lent it stops. But you go ahead and you say it anyway because our pieties and our prayer go along hand in hand, and piety is supposed to help prayer. Saying amen at the end of a prayer or amen hallelujah at the end of a, of a dismissal is a way of helping us come out of prayer. So we enter prayer and we come out and we use these repetitious forms of piety to help us do that. And then prayer becomes then a, a more um, defined space 
It's just not like you're talking to somebody and then you then you start talking to God and then you talk to somebody. You may be able to do that in your mind, but you don't do that generally out loud in prayer, right? You don't say, hey, Sammy, how's it going? Lord, please help us. And then, you know, you, we don't go back and forth like that. We enter prayer and we come out of prayer. And our piety helps us do that. So before I've talked about piety and I've asked you to identify some of your pietistic ways. And I often talk about how the Anglican Church expects you to do certain things as a universal piety. So, um, so that we can tell what's going on. One of my main focuses in faith development is that you understand your own religious life. I mean, you're doing it. You should understand it. So you learn something. I did. Today. <laughs> now, that's something I picked up, and it comes through the uh, Orthodox Church. And you'll find a lot of priests pick up the triple uh, sign of the cross. Uh, but it's not really a standard part of the Anglican Church. It's some, and we all do this. The, the, all denominations are stealing from each other all the time. Uh, that's why you see Baptists with stoles now. That used to be a big no-no in the Baptist. I've seen Pentecostal churches with stained glass windows. Oh, that's too Catholic. You don't, you know. So everybody's stealing from one another, um, and that's great. That's what we need to be doing because that means we're accepting each other's ways instead of the way we know who we are is because we don't. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. Um, so uh, that just means there's a general merger going on, unconscious and conscious, between the denominational lines, which is good. It's taken us a minimum of 500 years to split. Now, we hope it won't take that long to come back together. And we just started, really, in the 1970s on, on intentional uh, becoming one church. So, prayer. Prayer and piety. I'll just put that up here. You need writing? You need something to write with? I think there's pens back there or over in the... Uh, or over in the uh, bookcase. So with prayer, then piety helps. So really, piety should be over here, helping prayer. And piety has to do with, uh, mainly with gestures. Some words, but if I say, if I say a, a prayer, you'll, you're gonna say amen at the end. Because that's our piety, and that's your piety. So, gestures and some words, short phrases and words, um, they support piety and piety supports prayer. Where did the custom of uh, women covering their heads? Well, where, where did that come? think of every religion you've probably ever seen on TV. Um, Buddhism, uh, Islam, and uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Hinduism, I've seen them wear something on their head, but it's not a hat or a hood or anything. It's like a, that lacy stuff. You go right through uh, the, uh, the see-through netting with beads or something on it. So because our head is the focus of what we watch all the time to understand another person, because of that, the head has become the place where you signify something about yourself. So if you're a married woman in some cultures, they cut your nose, and then you have a permanent scar, and then that's like wearing a ring that you can't take off. Then from then on, everybody that meets you knows that you're someone else's. So the head is a big signifier. Anything anybody puts on their head, they're telling you something. Even those kids that put the the ring, you know, the, the and, and the, yeah, the seventeen earrings and the, <laughs> and the nose and the tongue, uh, the tongue pin and all all that stuff. They're saying something. It's not religious usually, but 
I mean, they're trying to say something about themselves because we always, well, you know, you don't look at this place to know what, I mean, it's a bad one. Nobody's gonna see that. It has to be obvious and everybody looks here. Sometimes the hands, because the hands are exposed. But even like in Islam, women, every piece of their skin, everything's covered. You don't see anything. There's a little netting here in, in the burqa where, I mean, where you can see out, but it's really hard to see if what the eyes are or anything in a, in a full burqa. So, um, uh, so the head, yes, you just watch in religion what's going on with the decorations. You know, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, men that joined the Franciscans would get a tincture. A tincture is a, is a, a man-made bald spot all around the, and just a little strip of hair now that most of us have uh, naturally. <laughs> and, and you know, as a young man, you join, and they would they would give you, they would shave all the hair down to a strip. It was because it was different, and then that showed that he was part of an order. Of course, it could grow back, but he, so they would keep doing that. Um, and anything to do with the head, religion usually has a lot of stuff to do with that because it signifies who you are what path you're on, what you value, all the very, um, <coughs> like very simple thing, usually it's very simple thing. So when we pray, I would suggest that you pay attention to what helps you pray. What helps you get in the mood or uh, to focus. A lot of it has to do with focusing because we're, we're thinking of something different all the time. Oh, it's cold out. Oh, I'm gonna get some bread today. Oh, my toe hurts. You know, our mind is going around and around and around about all these different things. And uh, one of the the first part of the whole, our whole Sunday service is trying to get us to ignore the distractions and focus more and more on a, a theme for the day. There's a theme for every every day on Sunday. It's always stated in the. Uh, the first official prayer that I pray, called the collect. And the reason it's called the collect is because it's supposed to collect your focus of your minds on one thing. We're all different people, all thinking of different things. But between the song and the, the piety and then the collect prayer, it gets more and more specific. Then you go through the readings that are also related to the collect, or the collect is related to the readings. And then the readings get narrower and narrower, and they're all, almost all, every Sunday, focused on the gospel. And then the gospel gets focused more and more. And then the sermon is supposed to bring it down to just two or three points, right? So theme, you got it nailed down. It takes that long to get a group of people to begin to focus on the thing. All the gestures, all the music, all that is focusing on those points. So, and then you come out of the gospel, then you express what you've gotten from Jesus. You express it in the prayers of the people. Uh, usually what Jesus calls us to makes us mindful of our sins, so we confess. We restate our basic beliefs in the Nicene Creed, all those things. So all that is a part of prayer, and you can steal anything you want if you like bells ring have a beautiful little bell that you like to hear and like they do in uh, hinduism and, and they ring they ring a little bell Ding! a bowl they tap that bowl and uh that begins the the it's the piety that begins the prayer for the group so they tap that, that bowl. It usually has a certain pleasant pitch to it. So maybe you like that. Maybe you like lighting the candle lit. Maybe you like uh, burning incense. Maybe you like turning the lights down. Maybe you like facing the window. Maybe you like facing the wall. Maybe you have a cross. Maybe you have a holding cross. Anybody here know what a holding cross is? You know what a holding cross is, Ken? 
Yeah, one has been blessed by a priest. Yeah, yeah but it's a specific physical object. It's a cross that was meant to hold in a human hand, grip it like this, usually between these two fingers. Like the top of the cross comes through here. And it's meant to be a nonverbal way of praying. Usually when you're exhausted or in a lot of pain or confusion and words don't help, people have this holding cross. It's usually very smooth, rounded corners and all that. Uh, Beatrice had one here uh, for me to bless about a couple Sundays ago. Um, and it's, you can just buy it off the internet. But usually there's like your uh, husband, somebody like that that works with wood can make it very easily. And they can, maybe they get the wood and the wood means something to them. You know, this was a tree that we planted in the yard that uh, when my and my son was born and, and now he's 45 and, you know, we had we cut down some of the bigger branches and I made the holding cross out of it because it reminds you. So there's layers of meaning on that. But the main thing is it feels good when you hold it, especially when you squeeze it. That's a holding cross. Of the, uh, the Roman Catholic cross that we have at our house, it came apart and you put the candles in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I had one of those. I mean, my dad did, my family did. Yeah, yeah it slides open. And again, it has the, the, the objects that help you to pray. So you bring out those little candles and usually mm -hmm. there's like holy water in there, a little bottle of holy water, I can't remember. What else? But it's like it's like a pack and a cross crucifix. Yeah. It's always a crucifix, so yeah. yeah, which is different than a cross. Crucifix has a corpus on it. Corpus means body. Yeah. So um, corpus. Corpus. It's the body. Yeah. So, but with prayer, what I want you to capture today, other than what I've already said, is is that there are. From what I learned in seminary, this is the way they categorize it. You can categorize prayer lots of different ways. But then there, there's the there's the wordy prayers. Um, I don't know how to spell that. But anyway, and those are the prayers like the Lord's Prayer. It's a bunch of words in a certain order. It's all about the words. If you say something else, it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer, but it's not the Lord's Prayer because the Lord's Prayer has specific words. So that's it's focused on the words. But in, uh, in Christian prayer over the centuries, we have been able to understand not only wordy prayers like the there's such a thing as an Anglican rosary. It's exactly what you think it is, except it's Anglican. It's a little different than the Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic Rosary, a lot of the uh, forms of it tend to emphasize uh, suffering. And uh, the Anglican Rosary does not. So, but other than that, I don't know that much about the Anglican Rosary. It's, it's more popular, of course, in England and other places that are more conservative. Um, We've been heavily influenced by American culture and American Protestantism, which there is no rosary there except for in the Roman Catholic Church. So, but I, in every parish, I go, there's always one or two that pray the Anglican rosary. Anyway, but here's the spectrum. Over here, no words. So that the spectrum of prayer can focus on the right words in the right order, said in the in the uh, a fixed kind of formalized way, to where there's no words, and then you say, "Wait a minute, it can't be prayer if it has no words, because no words, no thoughts, no thoughts, nothing being conveyed." But this is heavily influenced by the monastic side of. Christianity that started long before there was there was a there's no such thing as denomination. It was just Christianity. And the Desert Fathers, the Desert Mothers, Saint Benedict, who started the Benedictine Order 
in the 300s, all these early church experiences end up being another way to enter prayer. So you can enter prayer through doing the formalized things. And usually, this is how you enter. You, this, is, this is the door. Wordy prayers are the door. There's something you can latch onto, understand, and practice. And they don't require any extra gift. But this side of prayer requires God to give you a, an extra gift. And this is the gift of his uh, presence. Now, the gift of his presence is, uh, is not unusual at all. It's just that we get used to God's presence everywhere we go. So we don't even think of it. So let's just say this is an extra presence something that is unusual and that when you experience it, you know it's unusual. But it's also hard to, it's rare and it's hard to, you're not in control. So you may have it for an instant. You may have it for a half hour. You may have it every day. Or you may have it once a year. Once, you're, once in your whole life, you may have this experience. And the, what I compare it to is that, uh, and I've seen this in my life, uh, in everybody's, you know, a lot of people's family, and that is, you're in a family gathering. Everybody's doing their thing after the dinner. Some are outside, some are inside, some are talking in the basement, some are playing some kind of game. And the kids, they're running around, and grandma and grandpa are sitting in some kind of comfortable place, not really doing much, but enjoying everything that's going on, you know, just absorbing it. And pretty soon you hear, <laughs> and, the, and the, uh, the kid, whatever age you can think of, comes wandering through looking for someone to pay attention to them. And because their grandma, or grandpa, and they are there almost for that reason. They don't like the disruption of the enjoyment and the harmony of the family, and they're ready to respond. Everybody else is doing something, going somewhere, eating something, but they're the first one to say, oh, come here, baby, come here, come here, come here. And uh, he, he, in my head, and that's not right, right? And gets up on the lap of the uh, grandpa or grandma, and they're just bouncing their knee and say, oh, I say, let me look at that, oh, uh, let me see it. Uh, oh, yeah, we, we need, I think, I think you need to put a little ice on that, and they take their cold drink and put it on their forehead or whatever. Okay, and the kids go, yeah, they're calming down, right? And pretty soon, they're so calmed down, they're not asleep, they're just there, and the grandpa or grandma is enjoying them in their lap. And the kid is enjoying being at peace and having someone pay attention to them and loving them and just being warm and held. This is the best thing I, I can describe this experience. No complaining, no whining, no fix this just the experience of being in the presence of God. And I would call it the big hug. I mean, you're not talking. You're not focusing on anything. You're just glad to be at peace. Knowing you're being loved. This is this, is this experience. make that happen with God. It's a gift. But Excuse you me. can prepare, you can get to a point to where you can receive that kind of experience. Excuse me. Okay. 
you can get to the point where you can receive that kind of experience, where you're open to it, by doing all these things. So what's here? Well, what's here is a mixture of, of, uh, uh, of prayer, of words, words, and uh, kind of uh, unconscious things. Kind of like what we do. Unconscious things that uh, that bring us to a different state of being, so that we we pray and then we let things go. We get a different awareness. We sit and meditate. We do these things that are kind of a mixture of words and unconscious things, and 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 we get a, a different kind of experience than just say sit down with George and say. For Sunday school today, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer ten times today. You got it memorized. That's over here. It's useful, but it's not useful to stay there because it's like any relationship. It's good to talk to somebody, but your relationship isn't just all about talk, 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 getting things done, accomplishing things, sending messages to each other, and planning something or whatever. There also is this, just being together. When you're with really good friends, maybe some of your lifetime friends, you know how people say, oh, I haven't seen her in two years, and we, we, we picked up right where we dropped off, right? That's, that's because you have all of this, all of this unspoken experiences together, uh, uh, good feelings, old, old memories, uh, old pains that you've shared together, hard things that you've walked through, all that stuff, and you have the words. And when you have that together, that's a powerful relationship. And the same thing goes with God. You've shared a lot, and you were aware of God when you were suffering. You were aware of God when you were lonely. You were aware of God when you were blessed, when you had a victory, when you had a healing. You're aware of God. So most of our prayer life will be here. This is always a beginning of something new, like what we're going through now. You're, you're going to take away something, and that will open a door. And when that door is open, you're going to start here with just like things like the, the concepts that I'm conveying. The... Uh, Maybe formalized prayer. Anybody pray uh, Hail Mary? Here? Ever? Okay. So you'll pick up formalized prayers and they're really helpful. Like you guys were doing one for the rector. You know, you were praying for the call of the rector, right? That's a formalized prayer. You, you did it here, it was focused on the words. And then you did it over time, but you don't stay there. And the formalized prayer is, a, is probably the only way to begin a different dimension of prayer. But you're never meant to just stay there and say those words over and over again. Now, there is a way that you can repeat words like a mantra. You ever heard of a mantra? Mm -hmm. Okay, pick a word. Uh, a visual thing, it could be a visual, but usually a word or a phrase comes with it, and you repeat it. You can, in one setting, you may repeat it a hundred times because it's a way of keeping things out and keeping focus on by drowning out. Every, it's like white noise, just drowning out the distractions and keeping focused on your mantra, which is helping you to keep focus on this part of stuff, the less wordy stuff. So you're using wordy stuff to keep out just so that you can experience the non-wordy stuff. Is this making sense? This is, I've never taught this way before, so. Um, so, I want you to take a minute and look through, let's say, 
the top three of the definitions. And what I'm gonna ask you is to pick out one, and then we're gonna practice it here. One out of the top three. So that's the imagination, the Ignatian examines, and the listening to God. I'll tell you what Ignatian examine means later. I think Bob is going to probably present some of that. He's going to do that next.